So, we have looked at E star algorithm and we had made a general observation that for heuristic functions which are not perfect, we end up requiring exponential amount of space and time as well. Of course, you cannot cut down on both because the heuristic function demands that, but we built some motivation to say that uh, can we have variations of A star where we are pruning the close list and then we will also look at variations of A star where we can prune the open list basically. So, let us uh, do a very quick recap of what we did. We said that uh, for the sequence alignment problem, open tends to grow linearly and closed tends to grow quadratically. So, what are the algorithms that we can think of where we can first prune closed, then we will move to algorithms where we can prune open and then a glimpse of an algorithm where we can prune both as much as possible. But remember that that this uh, in general this list tend to grow very rapidly. So, we saw this uh, motivation earlier with the sequence alignment problem. One thing that we had done for reducing space was weighted A star. So, this is just a recap that we looked at four algorithms, branch and bound A star, W A star and best first in this particular order exploring lesser and lesser amount of the space. The branch and bound explores most of the space, then A star, then W A star and then we saw best first was the least amount that it required. We also looked at the monotone condition in which it underestimates the cost of every edge in the graph essentially. And we had mentioned that that, that is the nature of the graph that we had constructed in our examples. And for A star the interesting consequence is that every time it picks a node, it has found an optimal path to that node. And we can design algorithms which never, never lead to look back, but only look forward essentially. So, open just keeps growing, but we do not worry about what is left behind. What was the role of closed in search? We needed to maintain the closed list of nodes for two reasons. Uh, so, here is just a small observation that we are calling it a list, but in practice if you want to implement close, the best thing would be to use a hash table because that has the easiest fastest access in terms of time. So, one was to avoid getting into infinite loops that we always said that we remove those children which are we do not generate them again. In general that was the motivation for using close. So, when we look at, look at best first search for example. We will look at other ways for search to be stopped from leaking back is the terminology that we sometimes use. And the second reason why we needed closed at least in the best first search algorithm was to reconstruct the path once a goal node is picked up by the algorithm basically. Now, in 2000, Richard Koff is still working on uh, search as you can see with his student Zhang. They gave us this idea of frontier search. So, the idea of frontier search is to only maintain nodes which are on open and the ability to throw away nodes which are on closed. So, in general if we were searching and the start node was on the bottom left and the cyan nodes or the green nodes are the ones on open and let us say we are about to pick that node A from open list and then we will add A to closed essentially. The closed nodes are the yellow nodes. So, let us say A is about to be expanded and uh, its active neighbors are B, C, D and E essentially. Out of which C and D are new nodes which have been generated for the first time or which will be generated for the first time and B and E are already on open essentially. G and F are on closed and we have already said that we are not interested in going back to the closed nodes, so we will not visit them again essentially. We will not generate them again and they are barred as we will see in the next slide. How So, this, this symbol here says that they are barred and we will see how those uh, uh, 
how this barring of nodes happens. So, when we pick A from open and put it in close as shown here, what we do is that at that point for the nodes B, C, D and E which were either new nodes or which were on open, we will say that we will add A in some sense to the table list for those nodes in the sense that when you expand B or C or D or E do not generate A as uh, a successor of that essentially. So, they are barred from generating A essentially and what Korf and Zhang did was that they associated with every node on open a list of nodes which were barred essentially. So, after A let us say it is about to pick E then the situation would look like this E would be uh, added to closed and uh, when E is added to close its neighbors its active neighbors which are D, H and I they are barred from generated E. So, if you look at this node D for example, it is barred from generating A it is also barred from generating E essentially. So, when it generates its own children it may have C as a child, it may have H as a child and it may have two new nodes as a child, those it can generate, but nodes which have gone into close it will not be generated uh, again essentially. So, this is the kind of uh, uh, search frontier that they maintain in which they can delete all these nodes which are shown in the shaded uh, gray, gray color. This thing. I have drawn them here to show that they were in close, but in Korf and Zhang's implementation they will not be stored in closed essentially. So, they called it frontier search uh, that you are only keeping nodes which are on open along with the barred nodes for each, each node in open that these are the nodes that you cannot generate and searching with these moves they can search only in the forward direction without in some sense the search leaking back into the closed node. That is one of the purposes that we had used closed for. So, this is how search would look when uh, it would find the gold node. There would be a whole host of nodes on open each with its taboo list, but it has picked the node open. But since it has thrown away the nodes in closed, how will it reconstruct the path? that it has found essentially. What they suggested was that do not delete the entire close list, but maintain a set of relay nodes as you can see here. What are these relay nodes for after a certain point when search has progressed beyond a certain distance which is roughly halfway the estimated distance to the goal which is characterized by the fact where g of n is roughly equal to h of n. Remember that h of n is an estimate. For every time a node which is roughly has this property, so these pink nodes are the ones with this property where g of n is roughly h of n, we keep them as relay nodes. So, we maintain a relay layer of nodes and any subsequent nodes will point to them as an ancestor in the node. So, when the search terminates every node on open will have some relay nodes essentially. So, some other nodes for example, may not be so far. So, for this node for example, g of n may be much less than h of n. So, it does not need to have a relay node, but nodes which are going closer to the goal will have relay nodes. So, for every node we know that there is a particular relay node through which the path to that node comes essentially. So, at the point that we terminate we know that we have the goal node, but we also know that there is a relay node through which we came to this goal node. So, this is how it looks at that point when search picks the goal node. It is a pointer to a relay node uh, who we have called as a relay node here. And it knows that much about the path that if you that we came through the relay node. Now, what Korf and Zhang's algorithm says is that make two recursive calls. One you 
solve the problem from start node to relay node and the other you solve from the relay node to the goal node essentially. So, two, two extra calls, we have already found the goal node, but we do not have the path to the goal node. To reconstruct the path to the goal node, we make these recursive calls uh, to recursively construct the paths and which is why they have called it as a divide and conquer frontier search algorithm. You are doing this extra work essentially. How much is the extra work that you are doing? If let us say the time complexity of finding the goal node is some function t of depth d, then the time complexity of divide and conquer frontier search would be in the first cycle when you found the path to the goal, then in the next recursive cycle when you found the path from start to the relay node and then from relay node to the goal node. Now, remember that then this will in turn have its own relay nodes. So, they will have four recursive calls, one from start to the intermediate relay, then from this to this, then from this to this and this to this. Remember that each of these is just a new problem which has been solved recursively from start to relay and from relay to goal. So, it will have its own relay internal node and which is why we have this value of 4 here. So, there are 4 segments that those 2 segments got broken into and it turns out that if t is an exponential function that the amount of time you need is exponential, then the complexity of divide and conquer frontier search is that exponential function t multiplied by d. So, it, if you solve this recurrence equation, this is what you get essentially. So, what is happening here is that we are not keeping the entire closed list, we are only keeping one relay layer in between, but we are doing an extra amount of work which is described by these recursive calls that you are making. And in general we expect that the complexity will get multiplied by the depth d which is the depth of the distance to the goal. So, you are, you are trading off time versus space. You are willing to spend this extra time, but because you are saving on space, which means that you can work with problems with larger depths essentially, where the state space is much larger. A variation of this? Sir, one doubt. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we are creating a list of barred uh, nodes, right? Which Names of nodes. Let us yeah. say with every node, we associate as an identifier. This is node, let us say n1, this is n2, n2. So, that also will take some space. That right? will also take some space. Right? So, it will be, you can imagine the open list has a certain space requirement and every node will have a constant number of neighbors at most which are on the double list. So, it will get multiplied by a constant factor. Right? But it will linearly increase, right? Since they are just the uh, previous of open. Uh, well, nodes. linearly in the sense that supposing the space requirement for open is some n nodes. So, this will become like n into 2 or n into 3 or something like that, where uh, how many neighbors you are storing which are barred basically. So, yes, it will get inflated by a constant amount, not linear amount in the sense that it does not depend upon depth. So, that was divide and conquer frontier search. A variation of this was given to us by another pair of researchers. So, Hansen and his student Zhao, uh, this was in 2003 and it is a similar, similar this thing except for the fact that they want to exploit the fact that memory is getting cheaper. So, you do not necessarily want to do this extra work of recursive calls in a, in a fixed fashion essentially. So, one need not make these recursive calls. Uh, if you can solve the problem by using just A star, why not just solve it for A star? It is only when the problem size becomes large that you may want to do this divide and conquer kind of an approach and what this is what Zhao and Hansen's algorithm does. They call it smart memory graph search and it is aware of in some sense how much memory is available to it and then decides whether to break up the problem into smaller problems or not. So, this SMGS or smart memory graph search keeps track of the available memory and only when it senses that the memory is running out, it creates a relay layer essentially. So, every time it feels that okay, I am allowed to have let us say 10 million nodes or 10, 100,000 nodes and I am approaching that much size, then it says create a relay layer. 
in the process it may create more than one relay layers essentially so which is interesting that is why they call it smart memory graph search so they may create many relay layers or even no relay layers depends on the size of the problem that you are solving smart memory graph search as given by korf and zhang it always said that okay take a problem break it up into half roughly speaking then break that problem into half and break that problem into half and so they did not say that at some point stop breaking the problem into half and just solve using a star this is what zhao and hansen have said that uh, if you can solve it in the available memory then just go ahead and solve it no need to break it down further in that sense their algorithm is smart what it does is that at every at all points uh, it identifies a layer of boundary nodes as the search is progressing it classifies some nodes as boundary nodes essentially and it is these boundary nodes which will be potentially converted into relay nodes essentially. so a figure should make that clear i hope and this boundary node will also serve the additional purpose of stopping the search from leaking back korf and zhao added some information with every node on open zhao and hansen are creating an explicit boundary node essentially so this is how uh, uh, the search space for smart memory graph search looks the nodes in yellow and gray are really the nodes in closed essentially the nodes in green are the frontier nodes on open essentially now a closed node is on the boundary shown in yellow here if it has at least one child on open so you can see that for all these nodes which have been colored yellow they have at least one neighbor which is on open essentially so in for those nodes this will serve as a uh, boundary that don't go back in that direction nodes which have no children in boundary are called as kernel so a closed node is on the kernel if all its neighbors are closed essentially so all the nodes that you can see on gray all their neighbors are either gray or yellow and therefore they are the kernel nodes these kernel nodes are potentially the ones which can be deleted essentially so when the need arises so the boundary nodes in the closed list are enough to prevent the search from leaking back essentially so if you just maintain an open layer and a boundary layer you know that the search will never go back to the this thing essentially so what smgs does is that it converts the boundary nodes into relay nodes and it deletes all the kernel nodes so all those gray nodes have been deleted and all those yellow nodes which are on the boundary now they are converted into a relay layer and then search progresses from there again the same principles will apply so for example you may have one boundary layer constructed at some point and at a later point another boundary layer so here we have two boundary layers as you can see here uh, and so there are two relay nodes there but from the last relay node to the goal node we don't break it up uh, further because the space is enough to just use a star so there it is the unpruned closed nodes which is stores what we sometimes calls as a dense path dense path is the one that we are interested in go from start to node n1 go to node n2 and so on what the relay nodes do is they they call a, it's called a sparse path essentially so you go from start to the first relay then you go from the first relay to the second layer relay and after that the dense path starts so for converting the sparse path into the dense path you will have to make that many recursive calls so in this figure that we are seeing we will still have two recursive calls but it could have been more than two also it could have been less than two also so on termination smgs has a sparse solution paths to the goal and it makes an appropriate number of recursive calls